Good afternoon. I'm Kate Ellis, Program Manager at the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation. On behalf of NICM, thank you all for joining us today to explore this important topic. This is a challenging time, and our goal today is to share actionable information and strategies on environmental health and justice. In the U.S., air pollution kills over 100,000 people a year, and it comes from a variety of sources, affecting people in both urban and rural areas. Pollution, however, is not felt equally across the population. Black and Latino Americans are exposed to more pollution than they cause while white Americans experience a pollution advantage, where they're exposed to less pollution than they create. To explore short and long-term strategies to address environmental health and justice challenges, we are pleased to have a prestigious panel of experts with us today. Before we hear from them, I would like to thank Nickham's president and CEO, Nancy Chalkley, and the Nickham team who helped to convene this event. You can find biographical information for all of our speakers on our website, along with today's agenda and copies of slides. We also invite you to live tweet during the webinar using the hashtag environmental health. I am now pleased to introduce our first speaker, Charles Lee. Charles is the Senior Policy Advisor for Environmental Justice at the EPA, where he leads the development and implementation of the EPA's agency-wide environmental justice strategic plan. He is also widely recognized as a true pioneer in the area of environmental justice. We are so grateful he is with us today to share his work and insights. Charles? Thank you, Kate. Uh, and good, good um, morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is a real pleasure to be here. Um, I wanna thank Kate and Josh Hamburg and the National Institute for Healthcare Management for inviting me to this webinar and to uh, really express my appreciation for their focusing on this important issue. Um, uh, my, my presentation is gonna cover uh, the following topics, uh, background on environmental justice and disproportionate impacts, um, the area of, of environmental justice and air pollution, um, particularly um, the lived experience of communities, uh, which is really important for understanding environmental justice and the empirical evidence, uh, structural racism and EJ, and then strategies and methods to advance um, community air protection. Uh, talking about the historical roots of environmental justice, the uh, four um, pictures or four items I have on this slide uh, kind of speak to some of the um, seminal events starting in 1982 uh, in Warren County, North Carolina, where some 500 people were arrested protesting uh, the siting of a PCB landfill. The, in 1987, um, uh, the first national study on the demographics related to the location of hazardous waste sites was issued by the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice. I wrote this report to put the issue of environmental hazards in um, people of color and poor communities and indigenous communities on the map. Um, and, and at that point, environmental justice was unheard of and actually did not even have a name. In 1991, uh, the People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit coalesced a national grassroots environmental justice movement and codified the 17 principles of environmental justice. And in 1994, uh, President William Clinton signed the Executive Order on Environmental Justice 12898 um, and called on federal agencies to identify and address as appropriate the disproportionately high and adverse environmental and human health effects of their programs on minority populations and low-income populations. Um, in the main, EJ is about the lived experience, as I said, of environmentally and economically distressed communities. And Kirschmoke, um, who is the former dean of, the, of the, the Howard University Law School, once said that EJ is the convergence of the two great social movements of the latter half of the 20th century, civil rights and environmentalism, and called environmental justice the civil rights issue of the 21st century, an idea that is really uh, coming to pass in a big way. 
So what is environmental justice? It's defined as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income in the development, implementation, and enforcement of laws and regulations and policies that affect um, the environment of public health. And at the bottom of the slide, you will see uh, some elements of what is a taxonomy of environmental justice. So moving to the idea of uh, the science behind uh, disproportionate environmental health impacts, uh, this slide shows um, the drivers uh, from um, the built environment, the natural environment, and the social environments. And in this case, um, a great example to illustrate this is air impacts. Um, of course, uh, everyone knows now uh, that the uh, uh, idea or uh, the um, recent crisis, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, dra dramatically illustrates this relationship. Um, uh, recent reports uh, point out the grim reality of disproportionate mortality from COVID-19 in Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities, um, and they have been shown uh, to have uh, links to both uh, air pollution as well as the social determinants of health. Um, what is really important to gather from this slide is the fact that this relationship is not just speculative, it's, it's, there's evidence behind it. Uh, one uh, prime example of that is the recent study by the Harvard School of Public Health that found that when PM2.5 exposure goes up, uh, the number of COVID-19 deaths also goes up. So in the 30 years since toxic waste and rape, the toxic waste and rape report, thousands of peer-reviewed journal articles have produced empirical evidence about the, dis, the, about the existence of disproportionate impacts. And these range from uh, studies that look at the characteristics identified here uh, from exposure and proximity to pollution sources to cumulative impacts. And these take place in all kinds of uh, environmental media uh, that are listed above, and it is important to point out um, that these also relate to the occupational environment. So talking about the idea of disproportionate impact, um, this um, graphic is important to me uh, because, um, you know, we're talking about um, uh, the uh, uh, spatial distribution and environmental uh, burdens and benefits. And typically, people of color, low-income, and indigenous communities face multiple environmental hazards and their lack of environmental amenities like fresh food or green space or, and other things. Uh, the slide um, kind of traces uh, how our understanding of um, disproportionate impacts have evolved over the past uh, two decades from anecdotal descriptions of the things that, you know, some examples of which are shown on this slide, um, uh, to um, a process or processes which can combine, which can uh, combine both pollution burden and population characteristics that lead to greater vulnerability. As a result, we can talk about uh, disproportionate impacts now in a rigorous way. Um, and essentially, um, I would define disproportionate impacts as a consistent pattern of greater uh, pollution burden and population vulnerability affecting the same populations, uh, same communities. It's primarily those with people of color, low income, and indigenous uh, populations. So two of the um, uh, tools that um, brought this uh, uh, brought about this understanding are, are EJ mapping tools that look cumulatively at pollution burden and population vulnerability, such as California, Cal EPA's, California EPA's um, Cal Enviro screen tool and US EPA's uh, EJ screen tool. And this slide uh, shows you the um, uh, uh, Cal Enviro screen, which does provide cumulative scores uh, for every um, uh, census tract in the state of California using the formula that is on this slide. And then the next slide shows the, um, uh, the environmental and demographic factors used uh, for indicators in EJ screen. The key thing I want to um, um, share with you or have you take away 
from this is uh, the fact that EJ Screen is totally interactive, uh, is accessible to everyone uh, in every part of the country, and therefore is a really useful tool or has proven to be a really useful tool. And we urge you to um, really uh, go and uh, take advantage of that. So moving over to the um, to the um, area of air pollution impacts and uh, environmental justice or disproportionate air pollution impacts. So we start with the lived experience of communities. Um, you know, in the South Bronx, uh, I remember uh, back in the 1990s, uh, this was a huge issue that the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, which is a, a formal advisory council on uh, EJ to US EPA, uh, uh, focus a lot and wrote a report on uh, waste transfer stations in the South Bronx. Um, and uh, today, uh, it still remains to be an important issue, um, uh, even though progress has been made. Uh, second uh, example I have here uh, is Norco, Louisiana, uh, particularly the community of Diamond, uh, which is uh, one of the many communities in the Louisiana chem chemical corridor that were post slavery share, sharecropper communities at the edge of plantations now converted to petrochemical plants. Um, this one, um, which is next to the Norco facility, um, organized to relocate itself under the leadership of a Ms. Marjorie Richard, and her efforts were recognized uh, with the Goldman Environmental Prize Award. And um, the story is a, uh, the community story is the subject of a book by Steve Lerner, which has a uh, foreword by uh, Professor Robert Bullard, a preeminent EJ scholar. And the last picture, um, uh, which I think has uh, speaks to us today because of all the uh, uh, wildfires now taking place in California, uh, is a stark reminder of, uh, about um, how um, certain groups are being overlooked. And this is a picture of farm workers uh, having to continue to work during the wildfires in California. California. Um, it is not only a stark reminder of disproportionate impacts that are overlooked, but a sign of the future, cha of future challenges related to climate change. On the, um, in terms of historical evidence around uh, disproportionate air, uh, air pollution impacts, I want to uh, take you back in 1992. Um, uh, this actually was uh, in um, an EPA journal uh, entitled, uh, this is the EPA journal that focused on issues of uh, uh, disproportionate environmental impacts and uh, at that time's environmental equity. Um, and um, it's entitled Environmental Protection Has It Been Fair? And uh, this um, brings um, uh, data from uh, the Argonne National Laboratories, which uh, uh, talk about uh, disproportionate uh, impacts. Um, I think the uh, thing I want to leave you, the key information I want to leave you there is um, the, um, in the graph, the percentage of the population near, uh, living in areas of non, uh, one or more non-attainment um, is the following, 50%, 57% for whites as opposed to 65% for African Americans and 80% uh, for Hispanics. Our current uh, studies on disproportionate environmental impacts are um, uh, uh, exemplified by these two recent examples, uh, one by Michelle Bell and uh, Kaitu Ibichu from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and by uh, Christopher Tesson and others at the University of Washington. Um, the uh, Yale study shows unequal, dis, uh, the unequal exposure on the basis of race to the airborne particulate matter components of PM2.5, or PM2.5, um, and um, all which are arrayed on this um, on this slide. And the University of Washington study takes a, a really interesting slant. It focuses on the differential between the exposure burden borne by communities of color versus the benefits in terms of consumption of those goods and services um, uh, and associates that with exposure burden. Um, 
This is, a, of course, a very intricate analysis as shown by this graphic, but it boils down to the finding that whites experience a pollution advantage of 17% less pollution exposure for goods and services uh, associated with their consumption, while blacks and Hispanics experience a 56% and 60% ex ex excessive excess exposure. So at EPA, um, there has been lots of work um, uh, done around the EJ and air uh, pollution arena. Uh, one example I want to point out uh, is the um, uh, is the figure on the left. Uh, the EJ's uh, strategic plan measure on the percentage of low income pop of the low income population in the United States living in counties meeting the annual and 24 hour PM 2.5 national um, uh, ambient air quality standards for the years 2006 to 2016. Uh, and this was reported in the uh, EPA's FY 2017 EJ progress report. This is noteworthy for a lot of reasons, but it's uh, especially for the fact that uh, it is an example of how EPA um, has been uh, trying to um, start to look at environmental justice in terms of environmental outcomes. And of course, we all know, and the challenge of our work um, is to make differences in the conditions uh, in communities. And uh, as hard as this may be, uh, and as difficult as many of you note, um, it is to document these things, um, you know, is a real credit to EPA that, um, you know, they decided that this was something that was important to do. The other study um, it then, uh, which came out in 2018, uh, is the study by the Office of Research and Development uh, that um, show how disparities from PM from stationary sources are, in fact, still increasing. Um, and, um, you know, there's a lot of um, things that go into all this, but one of the uh, things I want to point out is uh, as progress is being made, um, you know, the, uh, the areas that are left um, you know, in non-attainment are going to be harder and harder to deal with. And then the, in, in that context, issues with disparities are, are going to become greater and attention towards eliminating those disparities uh, is going to be uh, really important. I want to move over now to um, another uh, study, which I think uh, is one of the most important ones in the, in the, uh, in, uh, the EJ area. And this is by, um, uh, Professor Rachel Morello Frost and Bill Jesdale at the University of California at Berkeley. And it looks at um, measures of how um, segregated the relationship between uh, racial segregation and estimated um, cancer risks uh, associated with ambient air toxics. And what they found was a correlation between um, a level of uh, racial segregation and estimated cancer risk. And um, as you go, as you can see, the higher the uh, level of racial segregation, um, the um, the higher estimated lifetime cancer risk. Um, this is not only true for um, uh, for individual uh, groups, but also for these uh, municipalities as a whole. Um, uh, and so, um, this is a good way to transition to my next slide, which um, really focuses on. Um, uh, issues of uh, 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 structural racism and environmental justice, and these are um, this is a, um, um, a map. These are maps that were created by um, a thing called the uh, Mapping Inequality Project, which was a project of the University of Richmond and um, Virginia Tech. Um, what it did was to produce a resource um, of um, having the 100 uh, redlining maps from the 1930s for 108 cities, and redlining, as you know, is the intentional policy of racial steering for where people of color can live um, uh, and um, sy systematic dis disinvestment. Uh, this is overlaid against um, Cal EPA's uh, Cal Enviro screen results for the city of California, uh, Oakland, California. And as you can see, there is a correlation between these past policy choices and current environmental conditions. There are a lot of things to take away from this, and this is, uh, can be a subject of a full um, uh, webinar in of itself. Uh, but one of them um, is that um, uh, what um, uh, 
the uh, Mapping Inequality Project did was to create an information source that's going to generate uh, many studies, one of which was published uh, in February this year, uh, and that was on the correlation between these redlining maps and the current location of urban heat islands, uh, something which um, Jeremy Hoffman, one of the uh, uh, co-panelists here today, will be discussing. So this next slide is one that I just want to leave to you and, uh, you know, for you to think about because, um, you know, the conversation that we believe needs to go to, you know, other examples of public policies and uh, government programs, um, you know, that, um, you know, have um, these uh, processes of structural racism affecting them. And, you know, these could be in the areas of, um, you know, particip uh, uh, participation in decision-making, um, in uh, disparities in resource investments, or in equities in the development and implementation of regulations. Um, this is something I just want to leave because, um, you know, I think I would like um, to take uh, the last slide and then, you know, transfer that to something like this in which you yourself can start to think about what this means for you in terms of your own experience and in terms of your own work. Um, my, I'm going to conclude with talking about the emerging strategies and methods or approaches for um, addressing um, uh, community uh, 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 air protection. Um, and, you know, one of the most important developments is the um, uh, and, and I want to put that in context. I think that one of the most important uh, developments in um, the history of environmental justice is the fact that the practice of EJ has matured to a point where there are now um, approaches that can be taught, learned, and replicated. And a great example uh, of a great place to identify some of those is the uh, California's Air uh, Community Air Protection Program under the ages of um, uh, what is also known as Assembly Bill uh, uh, 617. Uh, it uh, developed um, a framework uh, to focus on community action, and many of these elements uh, are, of which are identified here. Um, there's a uh, and in addition to that, 13 communities were identified for pilot activities, uh, which involved the uh, local communities, affected communities, the uh, regional air quality management districts, um, and um, and what they did uh, was to um, you know start to map out community-driven strategies for addressing uh, air pollution impacts. Um, one example of that. Uh, is um, the what in West Oakland, um, uh, and uh, recently they produced a, a a plan called Only Our Air, which is the West Oakland Community Action Plan. Uh, the um, uh, it has over 90 strategies involved, some of which are uh, kind of the key ones are uh, here uh, in terms of moving uh, polluting businesses and activities uh, from from away from residents moving towards a, a zero emission port, uh, funding cleaning trucks, cleaning up industry, reducing car trips and road dust, and stopping backyard burning. Um, this is all available um, to you in this report, uh, only our air on the uh, Bay Area uh, Air Quality Management District uh, website. I do want to point out that uh, an important uh, person in this is a community activist, um, a longtime community activist named Miss Margaret Gordon, um, who not only um, was a co-founder of the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project, but um, uh, has become an icon uh, in this area. And uh, one of the things that um, she uh, had the honor of being is the uh, appointed a commissioner of the Oakland Port uh, Authority. So, um, uh, so I think that um, you know, in uh, when we start to look back, we're going to find three uh, important paradigm shifts, uh, and uh, uh, the experience in California is a great place uh, to uh, begin to kind of mine these uh, for lessons. The first is uh, moving from um, uh, large geographic scales to neighborhood scales. 
uh, where a lot of these air pollution hotspots are in disproportionate impact of communities are located. Uh, and so it um, creates the ability or opens up the ability to focus our science tools, particularly those related to community monitoring, uh, strategies to address local land use, uh, regulatory tools, and other, other approaches um, that were identified in the last slide. Second, um, you know, this involves a conscious attempt to involve the community in the process in terms of joint planning and decision making and other governance process in which the community has a meaningful seat at the table. And thirdly, um, I think um, the kind of things presented in this presentation um, uh, means that there needs to be greater attention on the legacy of structural racism and institutionalized actions and institutionalized actions uh, which address racial equity and justice. Um, the current national conversation on structural racism provides a good opportunity to collectively tackle this issue. Um, the West Oakland Community Action Plan has set ambitious goals as shown here uh, for the elimination of air quality disparities and a, and a good place to gain lessons, um, as I said, about replicable approaches which everyone in the nation can um, benefit from. So in conclusion, uh, there are four things. I think that um, environmental justice um, is proving to be a very powerful lens by which to understand current issues, um, one of which is, of course, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, secondly, not only um, does, um, is, does ample evidence regarding disproportionate uh, impacts of air pollution exist, but it is actually growing. Um, thirdly, uh, disproportionate, um, air, disproportionate air pollution impacts are demonstrably linked to structural racism. And lastly, uh, there are uh, replicable strategies and methods to advance community air protection that are emerging, um, then that is really good news. So I want to close there um, and, um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present to you. Great. Thank you, Charles, for helping us all understand more about the link between environmental justice, structural racism, and health, and for sharing some of the strategies being used to address air pollution impacts. Our next speaker, Dr. Jeremy Hoffman, is the Chief Scientist at the Science Museum of Virginia. His work on city and urban environments has been widely cited and showcases how climate and heat drastically impact some neighborhoods over others. We welcome him today to share his work and perspective. Jeremy? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, thanks. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so first of all, I want to acknowledge Nickham. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. And um, I would, you know, following Charles Lee um, on a webinar uh, is truly um, an honor and a privilege and then to share space with the folks that you'll hear from the uh, Greensboro Housing Coalition is also um, a, just a, a joy. Uh, so thanks everybody for your attention. And um, I wanna share a little bit today about just this enduring legacy of inequitable exposure to climate stressors. You heard Charles bring up the idea of redlining as a potential lens for interpreting this inequity, and I'll, I'll share a little bit about that and some recent work that we've been doing at the Science Museum of Virginia um, in, in trying to, to highlight and understand and then use that information to, to, um, to, to you know, efficiently dispatch resources um, both before the COVID crisis and then now using the same lessons that we've learned through studying heat and air um, in the COVID world. So. Uh, I'm first, because I don't think I know a lot of the people on this call, I want to introduce myself a little bit. Um, so I grew up uh, in the northwestern suburbs of Chicago, Illinois, um, and, you know, being a white middle class family, uh, we enjoyed a lot of the privileges afforded to those um, families in the 90s, uh, including, you know, regular visits to the pool. It's me and my brother there. Uh, and, you know, here on the right, uh, an embarrassing chapter for sure in the choice of haircut, but nonetheless, that was the year uh, 1995. That was um, the, the year of the famous Chicago heat wave um, that unfortunately killed, uh, or, you know, over 700 people um, and mostly in elderly communities of color uh, that were, that are, 
you know, really kind of disconnect, we're disconnected from their uh, communities. There's a really good study of this from Eric, Eric Kleinenberg. It's a book um, called Heat Wave, and then a recent PBS special um, called Cooked, Survival by Zip Code, um, because I lived that. You know, we, I was enjoying an outdoor yard party uh, in my backyard with air conditioning and slip and slides and all the, all that when just a few miles away on the other side of town, people were suffering um, mortality and significant morbidity um, uh, illnesses related to this heat wave where, you know, temperatures topped 114 degrees for, and didn't go down below, I think like 85 for several nights in a row. And then we all know that, uh, you know, as healthcare professionals and especially people with an interest in, in, um, you know, like the air quality and its impact on the respiratory system, like any underlying respiratory issue, something like COPD or asthma is exacerbated by heat and humidity and that, that can constrict um, airways and make it harder to, um, to breathe overall as the, um, you know, the heat and humidity goes up. And then you add on top of that, this kind of pollution, uh, things like PM 2.5, you heard Charles um, very expertly explain that there's some disproportionate exposure to those sorts of pollutants. But these are also things like NO2 and, uh, and then industrial pollution as well. So these three things, heat and, and pollution and underlying health issues, really tether me to um, this study of, uh, of my urban microclimates because we know that heat and humidity don't, uh, just like pollution, don't uh, express themselves the same ways across an urban landscape. And I don't think that there's a better way to explain that than showing you a picture out of my office um, at, at, here in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, and I want you all on the call there watching this slide to make a hypothesis. Of course, being from a science museum, uh, you can't escape making a hypothesis during a webinar. So when you think to yourself, we're going to fly into this picture like we were on the, uh, at, you know, the um, – school bus, the magic school bus, where would you go to find the warmest place to the touch? You know, where would you go uh, into, you know, think, think, about, think about where you might go for the, the hottest place. And then on the same side, uh, where would you go to find the coolest spot to the touch? And I hope, uh, you know, you're kind of thinking about maybe these different colors have something to do with it. Maybe the, the trees have something to do with it. Maybe these native plants. And what's really fascinating is that we've spent a lot of time at the Science Museum of Virginia learning how to interpret how the natural and built world uh, can either amplify or dampen heat extremes. And so, so this picture was taken with a FLIR thermal camera, a really re reasonably priced and really engaging uh, uh, public tools for uh, studying heat extremes. And so one, a couple things pop out in this picture is that the asphalt's the hot, hottest thing, you know, these dense, impervious, um, dark surfaces actually absorb more of the sun's energy throughout the day and then re-emit it back into the air as heat throughout the afternoon and into the evening. And then uh, that's actually what gives rise to the urban heat island effect or the idea that an entire urban area can be several, if not tens of degrees warmer than, uh, than their outlying rural areas. But then there's some really interesting things uh, about like the colors of the cars here having different um, uh, heat signatures, as well as the type of plants you know, these big mature oak trees on the far left of the screen versus the native plant garden being cooler than the non-native grasses. You know, these non-native grasses make up a large portion of our public spaces, and they can be just as hot as the sidewalk next to them. Um, so this one photo, I could do an entire webinar, I think, about the built environment and how it amplifies heat. But unfortunately, we can't spend too much time. But when, if you were to think about, like, zooming out, like going on a, a Google map, and think about like this balance between the natural environment, these green things, versus the dark and hard surfaces. And think about your own city and kind of fly above it. And does, does, what we might learn from this is that we need more shade versus less hardscape. And do we design our cities that way? Well, zooming up to the atmospheric level uh, over the city of Richmond and using the National Land Cover Database tree canopy percentage map from 2011, we can see that while we might quote tree canopy percentages over the course of the whole city, depending on where you are on a given day, you can have a tree nearby <clears throat> or absolutely no shade to speak of. Uh, and so there, the shade canopy uh, around Richmond varies from as little as 5 to upwards of 80% uh, across the city's landscape. And so knowing that these areas that might have less trees 
uh, may or may not amplify heat. We went out with a bunch of volunteers in a community science project in 2017 to physically measure the city's temperature using these um, uh, kind of sophisticated um, uh, thermometers that are taking measurements of where we are in space and the air temperature every single second. And by dispatching a bunch of cars around the city all at once, following a methodology that was adapted by Vivek Shandas at Portland State University and colleagues, um, we uh, volunteered a, or a bunch of these nonprofits and university partners in the city sustainability office got together dispatching a bunch of cars around the city. We discovered that there was a 16 degree Fahrenheit difference between the warmest and coolest place at the exact same time during a heat wave in 2017. And this happens to be at 3 to 4 p.m. And we know from looking at medical records that this 3 to 4 p.m. hour is when most of our physical um, heat-related health burden is occurring um, during this hottest part of the day. And you can see that this is kind of the inverse picture of that uh, tree canopy map, whereby the areas with significantly less tree canopy are those with the significantly amplified heat extremes. Now, we um, had to look at this in a more, um, you know, kind of health-minded way uh, once we started showing uh, you know, members of our local uh, policymaking world and, and, you know, advocates for environmental justice, we had to look at, well, what are the exact health burdens? And so working with the VDH and the Richmond Ambulance Authority, I mean, the Virginia Department of Health, ongoing work with them, we've been able to diagnose where uh, heat-related illness responses uh, go to the most. And so this is a map here on the right of only heat-related illness illness ambulance responses over the last five years, and you can see the correspondence between these two maps is, uh, is, is increasingly or striking. Um, now, uh, most of these uh, heat-related illness responses, 60% uh, of them befall uh, uh, black and brown communities where they only make up about 47% of the population in the city of Richmond. And even by um, uh, normalizing by population density, this relationship still holds and so we're working on an ongoing relationship with VDH to understand this more deeply. Then thinking about this from the side of respiratory health, you can see the overlap of places that amplify extreme heat during the summer are the same places that experience higher rates of adults with asthma. This is also true of other respiratory issues, um, and we'll get back to that in a second. But I want to focus in on a little bit that you heard from Charles um, in that uh, our urban heat islands overlap with uh, uh, parts of the city that were um, physically redlined in the 1930s. This was a um, uh, federally uh, supported program where uh, assessors were allowed to go out into individual neighborhoods around uh, over 200 American cities uh, and rate their residential security along a spectrum of perceived safety for investment. But as we can look at individually here in, in, the, in the city of Richmond, it wasn't so much necessarily about the residential security as it was about who was living there because this is the uh, area of the city which is known as Jackson Ward, Carver, uh, and Newtown East, and several of the um, uh, communities uh, in the kind of north, near north side of Richmond, where the type of inhabitant was referred to as 95% Negro, and then very, very little else was explained about this particular neighborhood. Just on the other side of the city, um, Windsor, Windsor Farms, on the other hand, the type of inhabitant was listed as the best people. So upon closer investigation of these maps around the country, we realized that this has nothing to do with necessarily the residential security in the sense of financial, but really who was living there and, um, and the perception of those communities as being worthwhile for investment. This is now cascaded into several econ measurable economic and environmental um, uh, uh, differ differences and in, in, inequities, including this one that we published back in January. Um, where we took satellite imagery of the surface temperatures of cities, averaged out where those uh, temperatures vary across those different ratings from A to D, with D being the red line communities. It, here in Richmond, we kind of the first test case was that it was warmer in formerly redlined areas. And this was diagnosed by an imbalance of fewer trees as well as experiencing more impervious surfaces, which of course, this also leads to additional uh, environmental stressors like the capacity to hold storm water during extreme rainfall events, which are also becoming more extreme. But um, when we zoomed out to the entire country, we had to amalgamate some of the cities into particular urban areas because they fell within the same Landsat tile. But we ended up with 108 cities in our study, and the 
uh, formerly redlined areas are approximately five degrees Fahrenheit warmer than their um, green lined neighbors. Uh, and this has significant uh, changes around the country based on which uh, kind of uh, region of the city uh, of the country you are. And this is largely explained by variations in the available tree canopy and the relative preponderance of dark hard surfaces and pervious surfaces across them. Now, why is now there's been a, like a flourish of attention on these HOLC risk grade uh, disparities, including this one, which was published just a couple weeks after ours from Anthony Nardoni at uh, Berkeley in The Lancet, which uh, investigated how um, at, at age adjusted asthma rates. Uh, or visits in emergency departments in urgent care centers varied across these different um, uh, or these different HLC grades, and much like our heat signal, it increases uh, almost you know lockstep with the um, perceived residential security back in almost 80 years ago. So it's incredible that these um, these kind of uh, judgment calls on these communities is now echoing as. Uh, disparate health and environmental outcomes, including here in Richmond. So I wanted to show an application of, we've now digitized on the um, Esri uh, RTS online platform. You can go and use these maps uh, freely um, to investigate environmental disparity in your own city. You can also um, visit bit.ly slash red hot cities and investigate more about our ongoing work with the redlining uh, and extreme heat. But if I overlay um, uh, those redlining data with EJ screen indexes, uh, like the respiratory health index from 2018, uh, the disparity um, becomes quite, uh, quite clear in that the risk for um, respiratory health index has higher percentages in those redlined communities, as well as um, something like traffic proximity. This isn't necessarily a surprise given that places that were redlined served as a, as a map for where to, um, to demolish historically black communities and build um, highways that allowed white communities to flee back into the surrounding countryside and counties surrounding them. And so I want to tie this eventually back to uh, work that we're going, that's ongoing in the city of Richmond via the RVA Green 2050 plan. This is an equity-centered climate action plan for the city of Richmond, and you can access information about it at rvagreen2050.com. We've, um, with their uh, analysts, GIS analysts, we developed a heat vulnerability index, which has allowed us to, um, to assess where vulnerable populations might be, including underlying health, access to adaptive capacity in the sense of air conditioning and uh, those sorts of things. And what we started to look at uh, after um, the onset of COVID was developing a COVID risk map, uh, which looks like this, and it combines both the risk of uh, being exposed to uh, COVID-19 or the coronavirus and the severity of um, uh, an underlying kind of health uh, predetermining a severe, uh, an extremely severe case. And it wasn't your eyes tricking you. Um, the heat vulnerability map and our COVID-19 risk maps look almost identical. And this points to that underlying structural uh, inequality in both in the social determinants of health that predetermine um, survivability in our urban areas, including here in the city of Richmond, Virginia. So the Science Museum of Virginia is leading a, um, a community science program now called RV Air, and we're working with um, the, our local DEQ, as well as uh, University of Virginia and Virginia Tech and VCU and U of R to understand how these disparities uh, exist within our cities, and then most importantly, how they feed back on the health and well-being of our residents. So we're actually going out over the next two weeks um, to test how people's heart rate variation and stress levels vary between uh, different urban forms and contexts uh, while there's still some heat left to squeeze out of the summer. So with that, I, wanted to, I want to um, end and just say thank you so much for listening, and I'm such a pleasure again to follow uh, Charles and then to cede the rest of my time and the rest of the, the opportunity to hearing from the folks in Greensboro. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hoffman, for expanding on the impact of historical redlining practices and illustrating how heat and urban heat islands are disproportionately impacting communities and health. Our final two speakers will focus on efforts to address environmental health through housing initiatives at the community and neighborhood level. We'll first hear from Valerie Stewart, Director of Healthy Communities at the Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina Foundation. She will be sharing the Foundation's commitment to advancing community health through collaborative partnerships. 
She is joined by Josie Williams, Executive Director for the Greensboro Housing Coalition, a leading housing nonprofit in North Carolina. Josie will be speaking about their ongoing efforts working directly with the community to address environmental factors and improve health outcomes. We're so pleased you're both with us today. Valerie, I'll start by turning it over to you. Wonderful, thank you. And here at the Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina Foundation, our mission is to improve the health and well-being of everyone living in North Carolina. One approach we've taken with that is community-centered health, which is our long-term multi-dimensional approach to increasing the capacity of North Carolina's communities to act on the root causes of health inequities through partnerships, policy, and systems change. And while this investment began five years ago, it's still very much alive today and has been a significant milestone and shift for us toward prioritizing social determinants of health and increasing our focus on advancing health equity. So a few key components of the approach that I'll just highlight are multi-sector collaborations, so it's clinical, public, private, government, all working together to identify the root causes of those inequities, to name those and get explicit about uh, how communities can create change through policy systems and environmental shifts. And these are community-driven, community-designed uh, solutions that really center the voices and lived experiences of those most proximate to the problems. These shifts all allow for community mobilization, whether it's environmental health or in addressing other systemic and structural inequities. We've been partnering with and learning from Josie Williams, along with Collaborative Cottage Grove, the residents and the leaders there in Greensboro, and really can look no further than to their collaboration, which serves as a clear example of the transformation that is possible when communities build power and pave the way for lasting community change. So Josie, we're grateful to you for your tireless efforts and advocacy to shift that power and the systems for the health of your community. It's so telling that you believe that we fight not just for community, but with community. So Josie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Valerie, and um, thank you everyone for, for joining us. I want to um, hopefully not take up too much time. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A. Um, I wanted to share with you guys today uh, maybe some under to give you some understanding of the reality of what happens in these communities um, when they are disproportionately impacted by uh, many of the um, factors that you've heard of in the previous slides. Uh, but first, I want to give you some context of our partnership that Valerie mentioned. Um, we lead the, or one of the leaders in the Collaborative Cottage Grove. Um, it is a multi-sector partnership that includes um, our health system, Cone Health, our Department of Health, Gilbert County Department of Health, a host of neighborhood organizations and neighborhood associations, um, our North Carolina Legal Aid universities, um, and we are multi sector partnership that also includes our city officials from the uh, Greensboro, um, city of Greensboro along with uh, Parks and Rec. Um, this was very strategic in understanding because we knew that if we were trying to address many of the factors that you guys just heard about in this presentation, you need a true collaborative multi-sector approach. Um, but the uh, underlining, I guess you can say, success of the partnership is the fact that we are uh, resident-led, and our strategies are developed by and with the residents leading um, at the front end. And I say that um, to say oftentimes we involve residents on the tail end of a, a so-called community change without asking them uh, what they want to see happen differently in their community. So our approach is founded on not just having a seat at the table, but they actually set the table. And so um, what we, um, just for us the background, just a little bit about the community. Um, I think from the information that you've heard, uh, we can all glean from that a lot of uh, the disproportional impact of the factors that you've heard happens in low-income communities that happen in predominantly African-American communities, um, communities of color. Um, so I don't want to dwell on that. Um, I think that's a given. 
but I do want to give some context regarding um, cottage growth in particular. There are other examples that I can give, but I want to focus this presentation on the cottage growth community. And so um, this picture that you have up here in front of you is a snapshot overview of the community. Um, what I want to briefly highlight on is the fact that this community um, has some environmental issues um, related to substandard housing, related to poverty, um, related to high incidences of asthma complications due to the conditions that, our, that the community members um, are impacted by. And so these maps here illustrate respiratory-related hospital admissions by patients diagnosed with asthma. What I want to briefly point out is when you look at these maps, you can see a theme or you can see a commonality. Um, one of these is the top map. The top map on the left is an actual red line map of Greensboro. And when you look at the red and yellow, those hot spots there, that coincides with the same map on the far right, that respiratory-related as hospital asthma. When you look at the bottom two maps, that percent of population living below poverty and the life expectancy, the, the hot spots, the darker colors, they coincide across each map. So when we look at the intersectionality between poverty, environmental conditions, and, that as, and those asthma hotspots, they all coincide within a particular area, and that happens to be Cottage Grove. And we see this across different communities and across the country. Um, the other thing regarding the environmental condition of this uh, um, community, it's well known um, that um, oftentimes uh, African community, community, communities, low-income communities, um, we have seen where these communities have been the subject of environmental injustice. Um, this particular community has a park um, named Bingham Park. That park sits on top of an old landfill. The two pictures, the first two pictures in this slide, um, the first one is a, ma a map that was uh, illustrated pr roughly two, three years ago. Um, that is actually where the incinerator, those red circles, the incinerator of that landfill was sitting in that uh, park or on that piece of land. The map in the middle is a historical map. That is the same map, just a different time. But the reason I'm pointing that out is because right there in the middle, Maple Cemetery, I don't know if you, how well you can see this, but there's a cemetery right there in the middle. This landfill encompassed that whole piece of land. Um, the streets and things that you see, now some of the street names are different now, but all of that still exists today. The map, on, the picture on the far right, that is Apache Street Park. That park sits behind um, one of the apartment complexes that I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes. I'm pointing this out because all of this happens is intersecting right in Cottage Grove, so I'm gonna jump around a, a little bit. When we look at this particular slide, the intersectionality between asthma incidences, uh, vacancy, substandard housing and poverty intersect in those same locations on these maps. All I did was shrunk it down a little bit and highlighted the area. So in this all, uh, intersects within this Cottage Grove community. So you can imagine the impact of having a landfill sitting under a park. There's a stream that runs behind that park and runs through the whole entire neighborhood behind the Apache Street Park that you see on this slide. Um, also within this neighborhood, we have conditions uh, where we have a lot of substandard housing. That is being improved now, and so I, again, I'll try not to dwell on it, but I have to give you the context so you can understand the reality of the conditions that people are living in. So this is formerly, now this is called Cottage Gardens, but this is what Avalon Trace, what this apartment complex used to be called, used to look like. 177 unit of substandard housing complex with a high incident of asthma conditions. So what you see in these pictures, people were actually living next door to these units. So you can imagine if you're living next door to this type of property, you can imagine what your unit condition is, is how that's being impacted by what's next door. You would think that that's an abandoned building. That's not an abandoned building. I'm just highlighting 
the condition, and, and just so you understand, there are people living next door. Now, particularly the picture that the window looks boarded up, so to speak. Um, that's what the residents were using to close the window. That is That was actually a family of four living in that with two small kids. So now that you have some context to understand what people were actually experiencing, um, the beauty about what I wanted to point out is this community is so resilient, so tenacious, and they started working with the multi-sector partnership to create the vision of what they wanted to see for change. And that included a reduction in doctor and ER visits related to those environmental conditions that re also related to the remediation of substandard housing that exasperated asthma, an increase in clinical community partnerships, and um, uh, being able to address the root causes um, through policy system and environmental change. Because we are aware from what you just heard and from what I'm describing, to make those changes, this is a red line community. This is a community that lacked um, investment into, um, the, lacked investment to the point that it created the conditions that I'm describing. So when we're looking to address that, we have to look at policy and system. We have to look at um, environmental conditions because these are the things that perpetuate that type of environment. And we won't be able to create those changes unless we address those systematic structures. Um, the, the community also wanted to have a walkable community. This is a historical red line community without the investment. So sidewalks were non-existent. Um, and so the methods and strategies that we use, Valerie described to you about this community-centered approach. Um, again, that multi-sector partnership coming together to address those factors. We began also um, and actually founded on, uh, as I mentioned, resident voice and community engagement and building capacity. That is prioritized. We don't make decisions regarding those changes unless the residents say that this is what they want to do. Because if you can get the residents to buy in and they have ownership within their community, then you can get a lot more done. And then also, if they are in alignment with your agendas or the organization agenda, um, then it's easy to come together on a common vision to create the changes and then you get buy-in across those different sectors. And more importantly, you have the buy-in of the community. Um, not that that's easy because there, that means there has to be a cultural shift. This is a very grassroots, ground-up approach versus we know that our organizations are used to working from the top down. Um, that does not work <laughs> over time um, because I've found out in my experience you can try that, but you will come back to the drawing board. And residents have the power as they begin to speak up and they feel more um, empowered and they've built more capacity. They can create the changes. We can see that now what's going on in, our, in, our, in the climate that we're working on in, in, this, in, in this world today. So we had a clinical shift. We wanted to collaborate directly with our community partners and our clinical partners. We wanted to have a multi-sector collaboration. We wanted to leverage the resources across those organizations and the assets in the community. We wanted to increase the capacity on the individual level, and that leads to increasing a community capacity overall. And we were doing that by creating sustainable strategies for sustainable solutions. Because at the end of the day, if the residents are helping you create those strategies, that's what would make it more sustainable. And that's why Collaborative Cottage Grove has been together with those partners, and they keep strengthening. We keep expanding. Um, and I've been doing this work with them since 2016. Um, and that led to a lot of advocacy for policy, system, and environmental changes. The reason I put this picture up, this is an actual flyer that when we started working in the partnership, the first thing we wanted to do was invite everyone in the community to come out and meet with us. Our partner meetings are usually um, when we, prior to COVID, we would have 30, 40 residents every single month come out. Now we do that online. That's been a challenge due to COVID-19 and the technology divide. COVID-19 is exasperating these factors. All these things that you just heard in these previous um, presentations and the things that I'm describing now, these things already existed. We were already in a housing pandemic before COVID-19. So when you take those factors and you layer COVID-19 on top of it, it's no wonder that a community like Cottage Grove and others that we see across the country are being impacted disproportionately. And so in order for us to continue that founding, uh, that grounded in resident voice and community leadership, we didn't back off our partner meetings. We actually ramped it up. So we start meeting every two weeks versus once a month. 
and we continue to do that. The outcome now and the outcome then is we still get that community voice at the table and we still are able to integrate effective clinical services and advocacy for policy systems. That led to the remediation of Apache Street Park, which you, see, you can see the pictures on the left, that led to an increased engagement, even though we're trying to do that online, we're just being more, a little bit more creative about it. That led to um, getting an apartment um, complex rehab, um, and we did that uh, through public-private partnerships and um, uh, some other forces through the City of Greensboro funds that they were um, able to put forth toward this rehab as well. The picture I'm highlighting up in that top left corner of this illustrates the type of meetings we have. That picture is an illustration of all these organizations coming together with the residents at the table. And the residents actually helped plan that meeting. Um, and I, I know that was quick because we're running out of time, but I do want to also point out this approach has positive and measurable outcomes. So that led to a deeper partnership within our cone health system. So we are able to share and implement upstream strategies. We are able to partner with our Department of Health in a more um, deeper way that our community ties are strengthening. We've been able to implement a uh, pediatric residency program where I know they have engagement opportunities, but they actually engage with us directly with us and work in the community with us when that program exists. Um, and then here's some other things that just to highlight on that program, the things that have um, transpired because of that. We've seen an A1C drop in over 20% of participants and a BMI decrease. We've had sidewall implementation. Uh, the Bingham Park with the landfill that I mentioned about, um, that is under remediation. Um, those 177 units have been rehabbed, and we have increased neighborhood access to healthy food and vegetables. Even now, there's a food distribution uh, site that has now grown to the point from one site to five, and now we're advanced and into Guilford, uh, Alamance County, and we're in Guilford County in North Carolina. Um, and that is not an institution thing. That is all led by community members. That is led by faith-based organizations, and that is led by um, the residents in the community pushing their voice to say we are lacking food access in the food desert in the midst of COVID-19 and no one's helping us. And so they started coming together, and that ended up having a food distribution project that's still active right now, and it's, and it's expanding. So we continue to grow, and I just want to say, close with this. Um, again, the strategies that we implement, um, more importantly, have to do with the resident's voice guiding from the beginning. Um, and the traditional norm of doing uh, like we've normally done in times past, bringing someone on the, on the tail end, doesn't necessarily work if we're looking at sustainable solutions over time. So I'm sorry that was really fast because I know we're running out of time, but I'm going to turn that back over to our host um, and, and let them close out or do Q&A or however you guys want to do that. Great. Thank you, Josie and Valerie, for sharing your work. Clearly, your passion and commitment to the community um, is very evident. We are running close to time, so I do just want to ask um, one closing question to any of our panelists that would like to comment. We had a lot of questions in just kind of looking forward to a post-COVID world, or even as we're still navigating the challenges, what can organizations, especially those that don't address environmental challenges directly, um, states and cities do either individually or through collaboration um, to help advance change, and especially bringing in an equity lens, recognizing racial disparities and the ongoing challenges of COVID-19. So I'll just open that up to anyone that would like to provide a closing comment. I would love to hear what Josie would recommend. Um, <laughs> I'm very honest. <laughs> um, I recommend um, being honest and sitting with honest questions. When we, you have to ask yourself, when we're looking at these communities, um, we have to each should ask ourselves, is this a place where you would want to live? Is this a place where you would want your kids to play? Is this a place where you would want, what would happen if you had to make the decisions between what you're going to eat, if you're going to pay rent? What do you do when we're sitting out in this community in Cottage Grove right now, we're trying to connect them to technology, we're in the midst of schools, going through one of the biggest transitions that I've ever seen and how that's impacting your children. And so those that are more fortunate than others, we have to sit with honest questions. And if you are having an issue with your answer, then in my opinion, 
um, that is your SB horizon of looking at what equity means. And so I would just say that that's what Equitable Solutions is about and how do we work together in an authentic way to create changes that are equitable, um, long lasting. And if you are okay with your child or your family experiencing uh, the things that we've talked about in this presentation, um, I don't think you would be. And so when we're doing that, that's, to me it becomes an easier perspective if you put yourself in someone else's shoes. And to me, that's the essence of equity. Great, thank you. Jeremy or Charles, or other, but you like to comment? Great, well, we'll just wrap up here. I wanna thank our excellent panel of speakers for being with us and sharing their work. Your feedback is important, so please take a moment to complete a brief survey, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. I'd also like to point out that we have some resources available on our website, including an infographic on environmental health and a place to register for our next webinar on childhood development and COVID-19's impact on children. Thank you all for joining us today.